Welcome back to my channel guys. I am so excited to have you here because today's video is not the sexiest of subjects but a very important subject when it comes to Amazon sellers which is insurance. So some of you may have received over the last few months an email from Amazon letting you know that you have um, sold over 10 thousand dollars in revenue for over three months and they require you to show them proof of insurance and maybe you don't have insurance or maybe you do have insurance and you don't have the best pol policy or you don't have the right policy that amazon needs for you to have so in today's video i am going to be diving very deep into the subject with the one and only ashlyn Haddon from ashlyn Haddon insurance and we are going to be answering all the questions that you may have when it comes to insurance. If you are new here, welcome to the channel. I'm super excited to have you here. My name is Sharon Evan. I am an Amazon FBA seller. I'm also an Amazon FBA coach, and I'm a mother, a wife, and also a co-host on the Seller Sessions podcast. Today's video is um, from my interview with Ashlyn Haddon on the Seller Sessions podcast. So it's gonna be quite a long video, but it's extremely, extremely thorough. But if you'd like to cut to the chase for a very specific subject, in the description of, of this video, there will be timestamps for certain subjects that we are talking about. And you can go straight to that subject if you prefer to watch the video that way. Before we get into the video, if you are new here, please make sure to subscribe. And if you're enjoying the video, please also make sure to give it a thumbs up. It really helps me to grow this channel. Also, if you are in need of an Amazon FBA coach, I'm going to include a link to my website down below. If you're struggling to find products to sell on Amazon, I have a very unique and in-depth product research development and sourcing course, and I will also put the link to that down below. Without further ado, let's get into the video. I am so excited to have you on because I think that this is just such an important subject, which is insurance for e-commerce sellers. I am looking forward to asking you a whole bunch of questions and then us scaring all of the sellers so that everyone makes sure that they get insurance. I uh, promise I won't put you to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know you won't. I know that you won't. I have to say, I've heard a lot of people talk about insurance. And when you talk about insurance, I want to listen because, you know, it's uh, you, you make it fun. So um, first of all, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you? Sure. And so, so my name is Ashlyn Haddon. I'm the owner of Ashlyn Haddon Insurance. I am based in the United States in Indiana in the middle of the cornfields and the soybeans. So nothing fun going on over here. Um, I'm a mommy of two boys who are five and eight right now who run my life. Um, I own an agency that we focus primarily on e-commerce insurance. Now we still do, you know, your home auto and life insurance, but our main focus is e-commerce and how to protect, protect your assets. So that's a little bit about me. How did you get into insurance specifically for e-commerce sellers? Because there aren't that many that I know of anyway, that insurance companies specifically that understand insurance for e-commerce sellers. There's not that many of them. So how did you get into it? I kind of got into it by chance. Um, I was selling home auto and life insurance for a large carrier. And one of my customers came to me and said, Hey, I'm selling on Amazon. They're changing these rules and I need an insurance policy. And I was like, Chris, no one likes e-commerce sellers. I don't know anything about it. I didn't even know that there were third-party sellers on Amazon. I mean, this was like five, almost five years ago now. And I was like, there's no money in it. It's like, just, can you just go away? And he kept bugging me and bugging me. And I was finally able to get a carrier to issue a policy. And he came back and he's like, hey, I'm in this Facebook group and there's 15,000 of us. Can I share your information? And I was like, okay, maybe it's worth my time now. And I started talking to more and more e-commerce sellers. And I honestly just fell in love with how much you guys truly try to help each other and help grow your businesses. And it was unlike any other industry that I've ever worked in. You know, I, I sell insurance to mom and pop shops and restaurants and things like that. And none of them have the camaraderie that this, 
this group did. Um, and then I just started listening to the horror stories of people saying, Hey, I've tried to get this insurance. Nobody will take me. Nobody likes us. And I was like, all right, you guys are kind of a redheaded stepchildren. And <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, I, I want to help. And it just became, you know, from one person in one Facebook group to multiple Facebook groups to speaking at conferences, getting to go to China um, to source and to learn what my customers are doing. So it just kind of engulfed me and I live and breathe Amazon just like you guys. I wake up in the morning and check like, okay, did Amazon get sued today? Let's look. Um, What's going on here? Kind of engulfed my life like it does with you guys. <laughs> That's really cool. But so do you or, or your team work? I mean, not work. Do you, do you guys work? Do you or your team sell on Amazon? So I feel like it's a conflict of interest for us to sell on Amazon because we have to know what you're selling, where you're sourcing, um, our private label people. Sometimes we have to have copies of your labels and who your manufacturers are. So I've made the decision that none of us, none of the team is allowed to sell on Amazon. We want to know what you know, but not do what you do. So that's why we're so involved in the conferences and the Facebook groups. That way we can learn what you guys are doing, but just not do yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> not do it. No, that's cool. You guys so, are crazy. I don't know how you do this. <laughs> I don't know how we do it either, but you know, we, we do it. I don't, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. I will say it's tough. Um, Amazon's, you know, amazing. It's changed my life, but they're also pretty horrific to have to deal with sometimes, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I went through a lot of shit last year with Amazon and I've got people that, you know, some of my clients going through shit now and, but it's amazing. So we'll focus on the good and the positive side of Amazon. Right. <laughs> um, so I wanted to, to, to sort of give some context also why I think it was important or why I felt the need to talk about insurance now. So about you're in my Facebook group and about a month ago, one of my members in the alpha group had put up a photo, not a photo, a screenshot of the fact that Amazon had put out an email, which by the way, I've got three accounts, never received this email myself, right? And they all make more than $10,000 a month. And the email said in it that if you're making more than, um, that he now needs to get to upload, I think it was a insurance certificate because he's been selling for three consecutive months over $10,000, which by the way, he's actually a client of mine and he's been selling for more than 10 K for months. Like Amazon suddenly out of nowhere, sent him this email and he put it up in my group. And then I tagged you. And then you were like, this has been going on for ages. Right. <laughs> you guys are just, you guys just know about it now. And I was like, what? So they're just yeah. starting to police it now. <laughs> you guys have yeah. been getting away with murder for a long time. <laughs> so um, it is inside of Amazon's TOS to have yes. insurance. Can you tell for the people who don't know, can you tell us a little bit about what is in TOS terms of service as in what every single professional seller has to have so that we all know, and then what it's also best that you do have, but you don't necessarily have to have it. Right. So as long as you are signed up as a pro seller, so you're paying the $39 a month or whatever that is, um, Amazon requires that you have a general liability policy um, requiring them listed on your liability policy. So let me kind of explain what the difference is between general liability and product liability. So Amazon says you have to have general liability with products completed, which is product liability. So let's say I sell this pin online and I say, by holding this pin, it's going to make you look 10 pounds skinnier. I need and that I pin. Say, Give me that pin. <laughs> I'm going to hold bunches of them. <laughs> and I buy this pin and I say, no, this pin doesn't make me look 10 pounds skinnier. It makes me look fatter. Um, that's false advertisement. That's general liability. That's going to be what you do or say as a business. Now, let's say I take this pin and I jab it in my eye um, and now I go blind. That's product liability. That's what your product does to harm someone or someone's personal property. So general liability and product liability is what's required by Amazon. Now, some things that you should have that's not required by Amazon, there's a lot, but the biggest one that I say 
don't go without is having inventory coverage or um, it's also called BPP, business personal property. And what that's gonna cover is if I've, you've got 10,000 um, pins in your basement and your house catches on fire or somebody breaks into your house and steals your inventory, you're SOL. Your homeowner's insurance will not cover your business property as much as you think it's going to, unless you can explain that you have 10,000 pins because you will only use a pin one time, they're gonna know it's for a business and it's not gonna be covered. So make sure that you have your inventory covered. That's a huge, huge, huge one. Okay, since we're talking about inventory, so then if I have all my stock in a third party warehouse, their insurance should cover that, right? Or do I still need it on my, <laughs> good question to ask about my own business. Good question. It should, okay. but I have, tons of third-party warehouses insured and they do not cover your products. So the first thing I would do is I would call your 3PL and say, do you have insurance for my products? If they say no. yes, then tell them to prove it. Tell them to send you a certificate of insurance showing that they have care, custody, and control of other people's property. Um, most of them don't. I would, I personally, because I'm, I'm, I'm a fear fear person, <laughs> unless I have darn good proof that it's covered, I would add it to your policy. It's not that much more expensive to add that secondary location. What about the inventory that we have in Amazon's warehouse? Amazon covers that. That one, okay. at least you don't have to have that. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's actually a really important fact that um, I've never heard everyone, anyone talk about. I'd never even thought to ask this question. If the stock that is inside of third-party warehouses if tomorrow that warehouse, you know, catches on fire or I don't know, whatever happens, who's, who's responsible for the inventory. So that's, that's really great stuff to know. And everyone should make sure that, you know, yeah. go ask the three, <laughs> after this, everyone's going to go ask their 3PL. Right. The so, 3PLs are going to call me like, why did you say that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So just to, just to make sure I understand the commercial liability which one is the one that Amazon requires us to have that's up to a million dollars? So b the general liability Both? with products completed is a million dollars. Okay. So, so be careful when you're quoting online. There are a couple companies that have popped up in the last couple of months that are selling these like $300 policies. It's only general liability. It does not cover products completed. Um, just remember if it sounds too good to be true, it probably, probably. is. If you want a $300 policy for the year, you're going to have $300 worth of coverage. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so it's just, just <laughs> yeah. know that it's, it's probably not the right coverage if you're getting a three, $400 policy. So in the insurance world, I'm pretty sure it's called a premium, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. How do, should, here's what I know about, about insurance. And this can be a test of how well I know it. Okay. I know that the way the premium works, it also depends as in how much you pay. It also depends on the amount of exposure that your products have. So it's not necessary. It doesn't matter. I could be making a million dollars a year and only selling, I don't know, let's just say I sell really expensive products and only be selling, you know, a thousand units. That would be a really great product, but um, it's not about how much money it's about how many units you've exposed. So let's just say if I sell 30,000 units a year, right? It's exposed to a lot more people where else if I sell a thousand units a year. So then my right. premium so, would be higher. Is that correct? Kind of. So it is based on your, on your sales and okay. your sales equals exposure. So the more that you sell, the more they assume that the products are going into the hands of the consumer. So if you're doing a hundred thousand dollars in sales, your premiums are going to be less than if you're doing a million dollars in sales. Um, it doesn't matter what your profit is it matters what your sales are. So if you have really, really small profit margins and you're not making anything, it really is not going to help you in your mm. insurance premium because they're looking at what the sales are. Um, and then these insurance policies are what they call auditable. Um, mm. So at the end of your policy period, if you say, hey, Ashlyn, I'm selling $250,000 in sales. And after a, you know your policy comes up, you did a million dollars in sales. The insurance companies aren't going to say, oh, don't worry about that. They're going to say, here's a bill, pay me the difference. So it is very much based on what you're selling and how much of it you're selling. And then 
let's just say someone hears us now has a panic attack and understands they need to have insurance because they don't, right? Let's just say someone tomorrow signs, you know, they, they get insurance, but they've been selling up to now, um, you know, for two years, let's say. And then in three months from now, so they've got insurance, somebody, a cu customer from a year ago wants to sue them. Will that cover it? Is it, is it rich? No, it's from the day that no. they get insurance. The day, the day you get insurance. So get okay. it quick. <laughs> get it quick. Yeah. So it's, so, so that means that um, it's not about how many units it's actually about the revenue, right? Yeah. Because you could be selling, you could be having selling, making less in revenue, but selling more units, right? Let's just say right. someone, someone who sells like um, really cheap products, right? They could be selling, having exposed their product unit wise to a lot more people. So that doesn't matter. No, they don't break it down by how many that units way. you're selling. They break it down by sales, sales. but it does break down by what you're selling. So let's say that person who's selling small little products um, is selling a beauty, a beauty product. That's going to be totally different price. If someone is selling beauty versus someone who's just selling a mug, um, mm -hmm. Kind of the big thing that I say, anything that goes on your body, in your body for a pet or for a child is going to be your high risk items. Those are going to cost you more. Yeah. I sell in beauty. So yeah. Yeah. There you go. Anything so that tells you little tiny things, but on something high risk, it still could cost you more. Even if the, the amount of the price that you're selling them for is, is smaller. So, um, how I, I know that I'm very careful today when I ask these questions. So obviously this is a general question, just a ballpark, right? Okay. For someone who's listening to us who sells a non-beauty toy pet, pet because what? Because people really care about, about their pets. And if yeah, you for kill some them, reason people like their pets. I mean, okay. have you seen some of these people spending $10,000 for like a pet surgery? <laughs> yes, I have. I have seen them. Um, I would probably do it myself if my husky See? needed it. So you, just, you love your pets and you love your kids for some reason. <laughs> I do. We do. We do. We, we love our kids and our pets. So um, let's just say someone sells a, let's just sell if someone sells this owl. For those listening to us on the podcast, I have a little figurine of an owl, right? And the owl drops. Someone, I don't know, falls because of the owl and blames it on the owl. Um, that wasn't the question. The question was going to be how much I'm getting confused with what I was going to ask with the owl. What, is, how much would that cost more or less? Let's just say if someone sells $250,000 worth of these little owls, how is much it would private that more label or, less? or just reselling private, private label. Okay. So private label, something like that, you might be looking at like $1,500 a year mm -hmm. um, versus if you're just reselling it like $500 a year. So the cost definitely goes up more when you're private labeling something versus just reselling someone else's brand. And why that is, is now once you put your label on it, you are a hundred percent responsible for what that owl does to somebody. Where if it was Johnson and Johnson's owl, then you could go back to Johnson and Johnson and say, Hey, you need to pay for this claim. And you know, instead, cause this is your fault. So it's all who you can place the blame on. Mm -hmm. um, and if the, your label's on there, the blame is on you, even if it's manufactured by somebody else. Interesting. I didn't even think, because I'd sell private label. I didn't, I forgot that wholesale, wholesale people exist. So if even if you're selling wholesale, as in you're buying somebody else's product and selling it on not just Amazon, anywhere, it's important for you to also have insurance. So what is it important for you to then cover if you're selling wholesale? Because you would go back to Johnson & Johnson, for example, and be like, you know, they're suing me, I'm going to sue you. So then Correct. what would a whole, someone who sells wholesale need? So the biggest thing that we see with the reseller, so in RA, OA, or wholesale, is the legal defense. So yes, that owl might not be mine, but someone's going to pull me into that lawsuit. They're going to list everybody in the chain of command who has touched that owl. That's UPS, that's Fed, FedEx, that's Amazon, that's you as the third party seller. And you as the third party seller are gonna have to defend yourself. You're gonna have to go to court and say, hey, I, I didn't do anything wrong. All I did was sell this item. Um, and that's where the big expense comes from. So in the US, a defense attorney is like 400, 
75 bucks an hour, you know, somewhere in the four to $500 an hour range. Um, and some of the claims that, you know, we'll get to later, majority of that is legal fees. It's the cost to say, Hey, I didn't do anything wrong. Get me out of this lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, insurance companies don't like to pay claims. So they have the best darn defense attorneys on staff to get you out of these claims. So yeah, you're not, you might not be responsible for a million dollar claim as a RA, OA or wholesaler, but you are going to have to pay for your defense. And if you don't have insurance, you're paying that 475 to $500 an hour on your own. Rather than paying it, let's just say for an entire year, just to have yourself covered. Right. Right. So an RA OA wholesaler might have a five to $600 a year policy. That's an hour to an hour and a half of time for an attorney. There's no way that you are going to get out of a lawsuit in an hour and a half. So let's just say, um, I sell an anti-aging cream, right? And I sell of that specific anti-aging cream, let's say a million dollars a year, right? How much would then, not just anti-aging, let's go with all the bad stuff, toys, (laughs) anti-aging, pet product. What was the other one that you said? Um, Anything that goes in your body, like pharmaceuticals, Uh, all of that. Pharmaceuticals or, you know. Vitamins, supplements. Vitamins. So I sell a million dollars, a minimum of a million dollars a year. How much could I then be looking at on a policy? I mean, it depends on what you're selling. Um, But I have clients up in the $30,000 a year range. So, I mean, it just, it really just depends. I I have some that are in the like two to $3,000 range um, up to the 30, $40,000 range. So it really depends on what you're selling. If you're paying thirty or forty thousand dollars a year in insurance, you're probably selling really, really well. So yeah, you know, <laughs> you may not be making good profit, but you're selling really well on, on a revenue side of things. So, um, cool. So now I think one of the most like this is the question I get the most, and um, I never ask answer any insurance questions that I'm asked because I don't like to take any sort of responsibility, and I send always everyone over. Yeah, you just tag me. <laughs> But this is the question I get all the time, right? Which is how can a non-US seller get insurance? Yeah, so it's been really complicated over the last couple of years. The insurance companies were a little bit more liberal about it in the beginning, um, but they've really cracked down. So the insurance companies will require that a foreign entity gets a US EIN and a US mailing address. That's it. Um, You can use a 3PL as your mailing address. You can buy a VIA box. You can get um, somebody here in the United States, but you have to have a U.S. address and you have to have a U.S. EIN. Now, what you do with that U.S. EIN and how you file taxes and that kind of stuff is totally between you and your CPA. But I've heard through the grapevine that you can file a zero tax return and have it be a pass-through entity. Um, Again, check with your CPA. I am not a CPA, um, but that is what my clients have told me in the past. So just get the US EIN um, and a mailing address, and then you were able to get insurance in the US. Okay. Now I know that you're physically in the US and you specifically have a US agency, but do you know Sorry. Do you know for a U.S. seller, a non-U.S. seller, can they instead be in, let's just say if their LLC, let's just say I'm an Australian seller and my LLC is in Australia, right? Can they then get an Australian insurance um, instead, like an Australian insurance instead of a U.S. insurance? Yes, but then your Australian insurance would have to have an extension for U.S. sales. If you're selling on .com, you would have to have that coverage for dot com i'm pretty sure that um i'm gonna have to check this with my husband because he deals with all of it but i'm pretty sure that we for example have insurance that covers us worldwide but i could be yeah, wrong so you i'm pretty sure a, it's called world uh, mm-hmm. worldwide um endorsement so you just need yeah. to make sure you got that which yep. which shouldn't you even if you sell it at, on dot com shouldn't you then also have anyway worldwide because anyway right. I could be I could be selling on Amazon USA, but I could have tomorrow someone in the UK purchase my product and then sue me. And if I didn't have worldwide, then wouldn't I not be covered? 
It depends on where they bring the lawsuit. If they bring mm-hmm. the lawsuit in the United States, then you would have coverage. But if they bring the lawsuit in the foreign in the foreign country, then you wouldn't have co- you wouldn't have coverage. So if so, you're selling on anywhere else besides .com, then I highly recommend getting the worldwide coverage. And when you apply with my agency, we we specifically ask, are you selling in any other countries? And as long as you're honest with us and say, yes, I'm selling in Australia or I'm selling in, you know, Canada or whatever, we add that coverage for you. So Mm -hmm. make sure you're honest when you apply for an insurance. (laughs) Because I can tell you is when you sell on .com, unless you turn it off, um, you allow Amazon for non-US buyers to also buy your product. So sometimes you could have someone, you know, in, I don't know, Africa buy your product right? Yeah. For example, that was the first country that came to my mind, but they could, <laughs> they could they, you know, buy a product there or, or, you know, in Europe, even though they could buy it from, you know, Germany, UK, whatever, but they decided to buy it from your .com. So sometimes you don't even necessarily know where someone's yeah. going to buy it. And that's where I think it would be important to make sure that you have worldwide. Um, what's it called in insurance language? The worldwide. It's called worldwide, worldwide coverage. Yeah. Worldwide yep. coverage. Okay. Cool. Now, um, I knew that I I was bringing you on and then we were pre-recording this so people wouldn't necessarily be able to ask questions live. So I did ask some people if they had questions before and somebody asked an interesting question, which I'm going to make, like, I really hope I understand it correctly, which was, can an insurer back out of the liability claim? Does that sound like I've uh, um, read that question correctly or should I go read it back again? Um. Good question. I I wouldn't know how you would back out of it. Yeah. I don't mean, I'm wondering if they're meaning like back out of the policy. Like, could you cancel the policy? Yeah. Well, I'll try and find it for a second. Um, but I think it was like, hold on. You can't just say, oh no, I'm not going to pay that liability claim. I mean, yeah. that's what your insurance policy is for, is to defend you from that. I can't find it right this second. So I'll look for it later. But like 95% of the questions were about non, um, non US. There is a good question here. What does the insurance cover? We spoke about that, but if a buyer got health, health issues, does insurance cover their health insurance and pay for hospital costs? Yeah. So your policy does come with medical payments, um, a little bit of medical payments. That's kind of what we call like your hush money. We're going to help get you better. So you don't sue. And then if you decide to sue, that's where that million dollars of coverage comes in. So if they, if you, they get hurt, um, we're, we're seeing a lot of like skin irritations, like people who are selling t-shirts and clothing from overseas that they're getting a lot of like skin irritation and having to go to the doctor for that. So, I mean, even Mm -hmm. if you think, Hey, I sell a t-shirt, you know, a t-shirt that's not high risk. People can say, people can say anything, honestly, yeah. people can say anything um, and get, get you pulled into a lawsuit. Okay. Is there, um, what is the sales threshold for which insurance will be recommended? So there Amazon is, no is now policing it at the $10,000 mm-hmm. for three consecutive months. Now, mm-hmm. when should you, when should you get it? Absolutely. The very first time you ship an item, that first item that you ship could cause damage to someone. So I would say as soon as you start selling, you should have it. But Amazon's only going to police it right now at that $10,000 um, each month for the consecutive three months. Do you think that Amazon's going to make it? I mean, this is just your opinion. It's just a question. Do you think that Amazon is going to make it um, necessary for everyone eventually to upload their insurance certificate? I do. I really, I really do. So Amazon has been in so many lawsuits lately that I think they're just tired of the BS and trying to support the, the people who are selling crap products. So I think they will, but there's what three over 3 million sellers in the U S and I just don't think they have the capacity to do that right now. Um, But this is the first step. And I really think it's going to continue to move move down the line and everybody's going to have to have it. And I think moving forward, newbies trying to get on the platform are going to have have to have have their certificate of insurance. That'll be interesting to see how the Chinese deal with it. Yeah. I mean, they're going to have to, you know, these people have two, 300 counts. They're going to have to have two or 300 certificates. Yeah. That's, 
that's that's I'm I'm for that to be honest. I'm yeah, for that. Yeah. It's, it's one it'll more. Get some of the crap off the stage. Yeah. The <laughs> I, I I I think that's a good idea. Um, cool. So that's the probably the amount of questions that I had. Now I have um, heard some horror stories, and I wanted you to share a few of them. And one particular one um, that I told you about before we started, which is about the t- the tripping over, because I think it's important for people to understand that you can even get sued from people being idiots. Yeah. So could you share <laughs> that story with everyone so they can understand how important insurance really is? Um, because even if someone trips over, they can sue you. Yeah. So we had a claim a couple of years ago for a third-party seller that was shipping a very low risk item. So again, like I said, everybody says, well, I don't sell anything risky. So for the sake of the argument, we're going to, we're going to say it was this pen again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. God love this pen. Paul pen. (laughs) Right. So the customer, let's say Sharon bought my pen. Um, I'm the third party seller. Sharon bought my pen, shipped it to her house. Um, In the morning, she did not pick up the package, opened her front door and tripped over the box literally just tripped over the box, broke her clavicle and broke her hip and then decided to sue. She decides to sue Amazon. She decides to sue me and she decides to sue UPS or USPS, the postal service. Yeah. Okay. She lists all of us in the lawsuit. It cost the carrier over $32,000 to defend our third party seller for this idiot tripping over a box. So again, this is not her brand. All she did was ship it. And it was $32,000 to say, hey, this is not my fault. Get me out of this lawsuit. How is that legal? I honestly don't get it. That's, how is that even legal? How can somebody, how can I as a seller be liable for the fact that some, like, I'm sorry, but idiot did not right. see that they have, it's, it wasn't my my product. It was the fact that they did not see that the UPS person had put the box and they, you know, tripped over it. How can that even be like a thing where they- And you're not, you were, you're not liable for it. The judge mm-hmm. says, no, this, you know, their third party seller had nothing to do with it, but it was the the cost of the defense. It was the, yeah. the legal part of it, the attorney to get in there and depose everybody and do all the legal fees and go to court and say, hey, Sharon's not responsible, let her go. And that's what I was trying to say earlier is you don't have to be held responsible, legally responsible for something for you to be pulled into that lawsuit and for you to have to defend yourself. Defend yourself. Yeah. And we, we get this all the time. Like customers are like, well, we have an LLC, so we don't need insurance. And I'm like, okay, pick up the phone and call your LLC and say, hey, you've been sued, come to court and defend me. There's nobody there to defend you. Yes, an LLC is great. It's a great line of defense, but they are not going to come to court and defend you from some idiot tripping over a box. Do you have another story for us? Because I know you do. Yeah. Another story for us about, <laughs> about something that happened to someone and then they tried to sue the third party seller so yeah. that, you know. It can be. So um, I'll talk about a private label one that we just went through this year. We just, um, just settled it. Well, I guess it was 20, 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, she was selling, I don't know if you guys see them over there, but they like latch on top of your door and then you kind of like pull them down and like resistance mm-hmm. bands for yeah. the, or skinny yeah. people, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> people that want to be skinny. Yep. Got people it. Yeah. Want to be skinny. Obviously I don't use them. <laughs> Neither um, do I. <laughs> but the private label seller had all of the warning labels, had a book, how to install it, had YouTube videos on how to install it, pictures on how to install it. All of these things, they did things the right way. Absolutely did things the right way, but it snapped off, came back and hit this guy in the eye And he was a surgeon and said that he was not able to perform his duties anymore. Um, He was seeking like over $3 million in damages. Um, Wow. But they settled it. I've got the check right there. Like giant check, like $632,000. So her policy was about, I was close to like seven grand a year. 
um, for this private label brand, and they ended up paying out six hundred and thirty-two thousand dollars. So that's between legal fees and their their judgment. Wow, that's for for quick and resistant bands. That's just crazy. Yeah, that's insane. I guess that's stuff that you need to think about. Like it's like let's just say if I sell, um, I I'm only just really understanding how you know I, I need to go check all the policies that we have, but. Um, if I sell, let's just say, if I sell cream and then someone puts it on their face and then, I don't know, they claim that it now has caused them some sort of ler- allergic reaction and they couldn't go to their modeling shoot tomorrow. Exactly. That was gonna, they were going to get paid for a million dollars for it. Let's just pretend in my dreams that one of our <laughs> buyers are like Kim Kardashian and then they can't go you know, to their photo shoot tomorrow. They could sue me for not getting that job. Absolutely. Because a surgeon suing for three men million- $3 million because now he can't see in his eye. I mean, who even thinks about that kind of stuff? You yeah. wouldn't even. There was another that. one. It wasn't our client, but it was like a retractable dog leash. And the same thing happened. The retractable dog leash snapped and hit him in the eye. And he was an architect. And he was like, now I can't, I can't can see, I see my vision's off. All, all of these types of, you know, stories. Mm. Um, I don't know what the settlement was on that one. Cause it wasn't my, my client, but again, People are like, well, it's just a dog leash. It's a, whatever. Yeah. But you you got to think about what it could be used for also. Um, instead of just like, it's a dog leash. Yeah. A child could get a hold of it and strangle themselves. Mm-hmm. Somebody could, it could snap, that kind of stuff. So one of our clients had a, um, I don't really got like a baby Bjorn or whatever it's called. It's mm-hmm. like fabric that you wrap around your body and you stuff your kid in it. Yeah. And she came to me and she's like, Ashlyn, it's just a yard of fabric. And I'm like, but you've got to understand that this yard of fabric is responsible for holding a child five feet off the ground. What if the Velcro breaks? What if you bend over and the child falls out? Like, you've got to understand, like, yes, in a perfect world, this is a yard of fabric, but we're not in a perfect world. We're in a world full of stupid people who do stupid things. And mm-hmm. sue because they're stupid, not because you are. Um, yeah. So you got to think about the other things that could be used for and misused for. Not only that, sometimes there are you know fuck ups in your right? in your manufacturing process. Even if you've had inspections done, you know I've had to recall in the past because even though you know products have passed inspections, but someone's complained about something. Thank God I've never been sued for anything, but you know. So, wow, this is just, uh, this is just really like, uh, here's the thing. It's an important subject, but it's a really scary subject. Um, but I do think I, you know, that I work with a lot of private label sellers and I think that it's even important to think about and consider insurance, even in the product selection part, when you haven't even put in your purchase order and, and actually source the product, because, you know, there are people that, um, I don't know, let's just say having a specific type of toy could add another one insurance could add another 50 cents per unit or another dollar per yeah. unit. And they don't even think about that. So yeah. let's just say if somebody, how, okay, this is probably not a good question to ask you, but I'm going <laughs> to ask it anyway. Let's just say I'm now interested. I'm a newbie and I'm interested in selling a product, right? And I'm just about to make the final decision of whether I should go through with this product or not. But I really, before I make that final decision, want to understand what kind of insurance I would need to pay for it. How would I then go about, because I also don't want to necessarily, I think about these things because I'm also a service service provider apart from being a seller. So I think about these things, but the typical person doesn't think about the amount of time they will waste for somebody else on on a theory or something they haven't actually gone through with, right? Like, so if, if I was a private label seller thinking about selling the specific product, haven't actually gone through with it yet, but I would like to understand how much insurance I'd need to pay. What would be the best thing for me to do? Would it be to email someone like you and ask, even though, you know, like what would be the right thing for someone considering a product to do? Yeah, so as long as you're serious, serious about it, absolutely email me and say, hey, Ashlyn, this is what I'm thinking about. Um, What do you think? And I'll say, yeah, absolutely. This is great. This will be low risk. We should be in the, you know, 500 to a thousand range, or you better have a really great um, 
return on your investment because this is going to cost you five grand. Um, (laughs) Of course, I don't want to do that for every little product that you're, you know, considering. But Mm -hmm. if you, if you're really serious about it, and this is a decision that you're going to make, absolutely, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, You can even send me a message on Facebook and snap a picture and say, this is what I'm thinking. I'm down to two products. You know, which one would you choose? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, Um, I think it's absolutely more than happy to help with that. Or if you have a policy now and you Mm -hmm. say, Hey, Ashlyn, I think, I think I have the right coverage. Will you look? absolutely email it to me and I will be straight up honest. I mean, Sharon, you know me, I'll be like, ah, yeah, yeah, this is, this is shit. Uh, get yeah. something better or no, this is, this is fine. Yeah. Is there, before we start to wrap it up, is there anything that we maybe, I forgot to ask or we didn't touch on that you think is really important for not just private label sales, just e-commerce sellers in general to um, know or to consider that maybe we didn't touch on? I think the biggest thing that you guys have got to remember is you need someone who knows what you're doing. If you tell, you know, you pick up your phone and you call your local state farm agent or, you know, whoever, and you say, hi, I'm an FBA seller. And they say, what's FBA (laughs) run the other way. Like you Mm -hmm. need an agent who knows what you're doing, knows how you're sourcing um, and knows the right questions to ask. If you don't have the right policy, you're just wasting your money. So make sure you've got the right coverage. So when, if, hopefully, if it ever happens, that you know you've got the right stuff to to cover the lawsuit. That's a very, very good tip. Last question that just came to my mind. I just don't know if there's much of a difference and I'm going to sound like an idiot, but because a lot of this, I deal with this all the time because I'm a Kiwi and a lot of people think we're Australian. But I get a lot of questions from Canadian sellers right so for canadian sellers is anything different from let's just say a uk seller right as in if i live in let's say i live in israel or someone lives in the uk is there a difference for the way we get insurance in america compared to if a canadian gets some insurance in america or totally not for some reason can canada has been really really tough again if you get the ein and the us address we can do it Um, But if you're just Canadian and you're not willing to get the EIN, you're going to have to find a carrier in Canada to do it. I don't know why Canada has been so hard lately. Mm -hmm. Um, Canada's worse lately than getting coverage for Chinese uh, companies. So really just get the EIN and it makes things so much easier. Got it. Cool. Okay. Ashlyn, thank you so much for your time. I love speaking to you. You're just so, so it's such an important subject. If anyone wants to uh, reach out to you, how can they find you? Um, Best thing to do if you're ready to apply is we've got a really streamlined application on our website, www.ecom.insure. So E-C-O-M dot I-N-S-U-R-E, not dot com after that, just dot insure. Um, if you have basic questions, you can email us at sales at ashlandhaddoninsurance.com or you can always find me on Facebook, Ashlyn D. Haddon, D as in dog, um, H-A-D-D-E-N. Feel free to reach out to me on there. Send me a message. Send me some pictures, whatever, whatever works. <laughs> I'm on there all the time, so don't worry about it. <laughs> Amazing. Ashlyn, thank you so much for coming on. Um, and if anyone wants to get a hold of me, they could always send me a message on Facebook as well. So thank you everyone for watching and I'll see you next Thursday.